Thanks very much, Philip, and thanks for the invitation to come and talk here. <coughs> um, this talk's a bit different from the usual, where I'm going to argue about what I think needs to be studied rather than telling you how to study it necessarily. So that's the idea. And uh, as you can see from the title, um, the question is, uh, what should we be focused on with regard to floods? Is it the peak, which is what we've been studying, the volume associated with that sort of an event? or the duration of floods and um, in which sort of context across the globe. So let's see um, how I make the argument. First of all, what we do or what we have done largely for the last 100 years on floods is to look at the peak flow, compute return periods, and uh, play around with them. So the basic variable we have looked at is peak discharge. And as the last speaker said, it's assumed to be independent, identically distributed for statistical convenience. And you find the best curve to fit to it and live happily ever after. And the analysis is typically done at a particular point or uh, in a region. But the purpose of regionalization is to come up with better estimates at points by reducing the uncertainty across them. So the framework doesn't really consider the spatial field associated with a particular flood event and what the return period of that particular signature of floods is. So that's the first sort of thing to throw out. The framework also doesn't consider the volume and duration as statistical variables that we need to understand conjointly with the peak flow. And the logic associated with that was, you love this, uh, of course, if it's a big peak, then the depth of flow will be higher as well, which makes sense in most cases, but also the volume of water and the duration will be bigger. So one of the things I'll try to do is to see if in some of the data sets at least that sort of assumption is true. Now, what started happening perhaps in the mid-90s uh, formally and informally actually in the 70s is many people started questioning whether the independent identically distributed assumption was actually reasonable. And now, you know, it's well established that of course it's not. And you can have one trillion citations for making that statement and uh, in different contexts. But let's also look at the second part of this slide, which is what use do we make of this information and you know, what is the implication? So typically what we have done with these flood risk est estimates is the design problem. How big a dam or culvert or whatever should we build? And it's all indexed to either the volume or more likely the peak flow associated with it. And if you go to the insurance application, it's been typically linked to the property and casualty loss. You have the 100-year event. If you're in it, that's uh, you rate it. If not, you're out. Uh, today, what's happening is that people are starting to look at loss of business use. They're looking at supply chains globally that are affected in different ways. And they're also looking at economic development and how that is influenced by it. And my friend Philip sitting here is one of the people who's really been hammering away on that particular direction. So what are the challenges? So let's first pick up on the bottom of my last slide and look at the globalization. So what we can think about in terms of globalization are two directions. The first is in terms of the physical mechanisms of floods at any given place. We learn that those relate to large scale atmospheric circulation patterns, which may not be independent, identically distributed. And many places may experience floods or the absence of floods during the same season and that is actually determined by those conditions. And they may be predictable. So that starts changing the game a little bit, and it says we need to understand a bit more about the physical side of this process going beyond purely a river basin perspective. Okay, so that's step one. Step two is this idea of portfolio risk. So let's say I'm a large insurance company, and I've insured assets in many, many places. Now, what is my likely hit in any given year? And what's the probability distribution of that? How do I do that, given that the climate has a structure? Um, or I could be an agency like the Army Corps of Engineers, and indeed, I have a lot of assets that I manage across the whole country, and I can ask exactly the same question. The third is the supply chain risk. So let me describe two elements of that very quickly. One is I'm a large company that has taken to a global manufacturing strategy with a just-in-time inventory model so that I can have the lowest cost structure for manufacturing and the lowest cost structure for inventory and for rapid marketing. 
Uh, I normally give it a full talk on this, but just to give you a highlight, in the 1960s, it took six weeks to ship goods from Hong Kong to New York. Today, it's uh, less than a week. Okay, so that changes the game dramatically in terms of how that particular game works. So for that kind of a supply chain, I might need to know whether somewhere in the world where something is being manufactured, it's likely to be flooded. Somewhere in the world where it's being transported, that transportation channel is likely to be flooded. Or somewhere in the world where I'm in the distribution network, that is affected by flooding. So what's my exposure to that kind of a story? And then how should I manage it? The other kind of supply chain is that of a location which, ex which is experiencing a flood, such as New York with Sandy, uh, Katrina in New Orleans and so on. And the supply chain I'm interested in this particular case is all goods that are manufactured there going out or all goods that need to be consumed there, either in an emergency case or otherwise that need to be brought in because these things have economic impacts. Now this brings up what matters in terms of monitoring these particular impacts and the argument I'm making in this particular talk is it's the duration of the event which is much more significant than the peak flow. Because if I get a flash flood, which is pretty spectacular, but it's over in that day, I might take a few weeks, a month, whatever, to recover from it. But if I'm sitting there flooded for 90 days, that's a slightly different story. And, and we haven't really been organizing to look at that, so that's what I'm advertising there. Then in terms of regional supply chains, there are some other pathways that I'm concerned about. And these are those of cascading failures. So all developed societies, and to an extent developing societies, function because of infrastructure networks. So let's say that I've had a flood which knocks out my power supply in a particular area. All other critical infrastructures now are out, as long as this thing is out. So I need to understand from a flooding flood risk supply chain perspective, what are the hit points and what are the weak spots and how the failure propagates through such systems. Let's not worry about the other two for now because I know I'm going to run out of ideas. So I'm going to develop two main ideas. One is in terms of floods, how do I think about durations and the teleconnections? And the second is going to come in towards the end where I'm going to talk a bit more about supply chain risk. Durations. So the Colorado Flood Observatory in Bob Brackenridge, the, invented this, so he should be given a round of applause uh, from when he was at Dartmouth. So you now actually have data on a variety of things which are very hard to get at. So this is data from his website um, updated to yesterday, right? So uh, the key thing to point out is that many people think in terms of flash floods. Their cognitive model of a flood is an event with a duration of one to two days or not much more than that. And what you see is that globally, indeed, the median duration is only about six days. But look at long duration events. They are present around the world. And uh, they are not a significant percentage, but there are still quite a few of them out there. And they are pre you know, as I said, they are present everywhere. So how do those ar arise from a climatological perspective? There are a couple of pathways. You basically got hit with five hurricanes in 90 days. This is the Thailand 2010 story. Or you set up a persistent system which keeps bringing rainfall in. And so the event really never is over. But it's not the kind of event we have typically analyzed, either by rainfall runoff models, where we have a design rainfall event of a certain duration that we knock into a hydrological model or do something else like that. So that's the point that I want to drive out. Now, here's an example from one of the longest records available in the continental United States from 1873, Mississippi River at Clinton, Iowa. This place floods. That's not the reason I'm bringing it up. This is to illustrate whether if the peak flow is higher, does that necessarily mean that the duration and volume go up? So on the x-axis is the duration of the event. Um, on the y-axis is the volume of the event. And this is calibrated against the flood stage elevation that the USGS has recorded for this location, which also happens to nicely match the two-year event, which we have used in other things in work with Philip, among others. The red circles correspond to events that exceed the 10-year return period peak flow event. Uh, 
and the black circles are all the other annual maximum flows. The largest event on record is the 1965 one in terms of peak flow, but you can see that's not the largest event in terms of duration or magnitude. So you get quite a variation around that. And if you were to index yourself to the 1965 event as the 100-year event, because you have 130, 40 years of data here, that would not correspond to the largest stress you would face from res resilience. So that's the point with this particular story right here. Okay, the other thing is that the 2011 floods on the Mississippi were, according to this particular gauge, a 44-day event. But if you look at any media reports associated with it, it was a 90 to 114 day event, depending on which media report you read. So the question is, what gives here? And uh, from an economic point of view, what was interesting about it was the reported damages were estimated to be between two to four billion. Uh, highest I saw was 4.6 billion. The insured element of that was 0.5 billion. So the bulk of it was uninsured damages. And why is there that big uncertainty? It's because a lot of these are so-called indirect damages or damages to the economy that were not directly measured. Okay? Examples of that include freight companies which, who were not able to operate their barges. If they are not operating their barges for 90 days, they have no income. People who had contracted with them break the contracts, long-term contracts, and start shipping with other vendors. So these guys are out of business. Okay? So that's the kind of thing that happens. Now, from a climate perspective, this is also interesting because the same storms that had major persistent outbreaks were accompanied by extensive tornado outbreaks, which caused damages which are, again, not included in all this. So if I look at the picture of this, that's on the left here. So this is the USGS mapping of which guys were at flood stage, et cetera. And you can see there's an extensive network, which is at different stages of inundation across the whole thing on that snapshot on that particular day. Since the water moves, you can now imagine that over the 90-day period, if various gauges had 44 days of inundation, but they are separated in time and they are separated in space over the overlap, regionally, you will easily hit that 90-day window. You know? So if a barge can't go because it's flooded in the lower Mississippi, okay, that clears up, but now the upper Mississippi is flooded, the guys still can't go. Okay? So that's the idea that's being conveyed here. And the rainfall picture on this right shows the extent of it. Now, this is to confirm that the manner in which these storms were happening uh, is a persistent, recurrent sort of structure that lasted for at least 60 days. So the red curve is the one I would draw your attention to because I see I'm running out of time here. I should speed up rapidly. Okay, so the red curve starts from the date of the peak flow in the Ohio River Basin and records the moisture transport that was coming into that basin as a function of time backwards in time from the date of the peak flow. So you see there are multiple peaks coming in about every seven days, which is consistent with the time scale of synoptic eddies. The black curve is an average across 20 events in that basin, which are of 10-year return period or larger, and that structure survives the averaging across 20 IID events, supposedly. So that suggests that when we start looking at these kind of structures, we need to think of models where we can reprodu reproduce the space-time structure of rainfall over such long durations. Okay, so let me actually skip through this because this is basically to make the point that if you look at a whole bunch of gauges in a region, there's considerable variety in their peak flow, volume, duration relationships, gauge by gauge. That's all this particular slide says. The next slide here, focus on the right one. This is from the Northeast US and this work done by Naresh Devineni. This shows whether or not there is coincidence in whether, in whether or not in a particular annual maximum event, if it's occurring at one of those eight gauges in the region, do the others experience it also? And very few of them consistently experience that. So that's where the idea of looking at network properties rather than point properties comes in. Okay, quickly, looking at a global view, jumping from a very regional view, uh, let's see what happens if I look globally. And the key point that I want to make here is that if I look at rainfall extremes, because it's a bit easier to do that than flow extremes, unless you are Philip Ward, uh, we find that there's extensive interannual variability for every duration of extreme rainfall, one day, 10 day, 30 days, and those seem to be influenced by ENSO. So this is probably well known, so we'll move on. 
But the interesting thing on the second graphic here is that what you find is that as you increase the duration associated with the event, the spatial area affected is coherently increased as well, which means your impacts basically go up. Okay. So uh, now we come to work that Philip has done where he's run a hydrological model across the world that perhaps most of you are familiar with. And the key point from this slide that comes out is that if you look at the number of flood events, the relationship with ENSO is considerably weaker than if you look at the relationship with duration. This is a paper he finished a while back that I'm a co-author on that I need to finish my work on, and I've been holding him back. But the main point here is that you know, the duration becomes an interesting thing because from a mechanics point of view, it reflects the forcing in a more consistent way than an isolated peak event. Okay, so this is the summary of the observations. For extreme rainfall and floods, these relate to persistent and recurrent organization of atmospheric moisture transport from the tropics. This may have significant clustering, is not IID. It may affect regional flow networks differently in terms of peak volume and duration. We need to think in terms of how we develop multivariate network risk models. And in terms of duration and clustering, we need to look at this from a resilience perspective, which is a buzzword that everybody loves now. But from a business point of view, this is how you approach portfolio and supply chain risk as targets. Thank you.